by uh, uh, telling us uh, when and where you were born. I was born in Tampa, Florida, in the little Latin section of Tampa, Florida, called Ybor City. It's not a city with a government, it's a neighborhood in Tampa. And I was born in, in 1919, which makes me 83 years of age. And your full name is? Evelio Grillo, and in Spanish it's Grillo. Okay. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your, about your parents? My, I, do, <clears throat> I don't know my, I, I feel my father. He died when I was almost four years of age. And, I, and I, I don't remember seeing him, but I remember being with him and being, um, being nurtured by him. And my mother, and he was a, he was a skilled cigar maker. They came, to, they came to Tampa as immigrants, uh, pursuing the cigar industry, which was moving from Havana, the finished cigar industry, was moving to Tampa, Florida. My mother uh, was a housewife, reared five children uh, alone after my father died, and, uh, and uh, who went to work in the cigar factories too. She was a less skilled um, worker than my father was, but nonetheless she was she was a cigar maker. Um, the interesting, interesting thing about that is that, is that while, while the Jim Crow order of the South applied to us, and we were... Hold, hold, hold on a second. Do you want a cough cup? Yeah. Oh, we, we don't want the coughing on the uh, <laughs> soundtrack. I've got some cough drops uh, with me. If you don't, too. One. <coughs> I got another one in case you need. Just open this mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. So let's see. We were. Um, you're talking about your brothers and sisters. I was talking about my mother, oh, your mother yes. who was a cigar maker, and I was drawing attention to what may have seemed like an anomaly, because while we were clearly counted am among the black, the African American. Uh, minority, minority, the anomaly was that in the cigar factories, blacks and whites worked side by side. Black Cubans and, black and white Cubans worked in the cigar factories together. And when quitting time came, they, they went into their black life and their white life. Uh -huh. And were the was the uh, were the housing segregated? And, uh, no, there? but but it was segre segregated by class. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the more the, the more one moved out from the center of the city, the the more substantial the houses were. So in in a sense, there was a a class separation, but not a racial separation in housing between the sort of white Cubans and the black Cubans? No, there, there wasn't. There wasn't a, a housing segregation as such. But the white Cubans were more affluent, so they, they, they qualified for the better housing, which, which tended to be on the edges of the ghetto. Not a ghetto, but the neighborhood. It, it didn't have the feel of a ghetto. It was a complicated pattern. It's a complicated pattern that you had there, since you had white Floridians, and then you had white Cubans, and you had 
black Cubans, uh, describe just exactly how people mixed uh, within the within the city. Well, the black Cubans, um, the black Cubans f formed a community and had our own community center. The white Cubans had their much more elaborate uh, community center. Uh, the black Cubans, on the other hand, um, had had relationships with the African American English speaking people, and the white Cubans had relationships with the English speaking whites, and and in in that mix, uh, you had all kinds of permutations mm -hmm. as to how your relationships worked out. My mother, for example, had uh, her best friend was a was a, an African American um, contemporary who lived right right behind us, and she took care of me, and loved me, and nurtured me, and. And uh, Mrs. Biner was like my mother, so so that's and she my mother had had closer relationships with African American English speaking than she had with white Cuban Spanish speaking people. Well, you mentioned in your book that there was a movie theater in town. Oh yes, which was. Segregated, right? Oh yes, yes. It was. It was in the clearly Ameri African American ghetto. That was a ghetto. And and our our little enclave overlapped the African American ghetto, and we lived uh, amongst African Americans, and uh, and. Uh, we became culturally African Americans. Um, um, let's see, what was I trying to tell you? I, well, the, the, the movie theater was for blacks only, is that right? Oh, the yes, wonderful? for blacks only. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, there was a little tension between black Cubans and, Af and, black, and black Americans. Uh, but it never, it never developed into any hostility. Uh, but they would scare us. <laughs> so we had to travel all the way. We had to travel through the ghetto in, in groups, you know, to go to the theater. Mm -hmm. The then, central theater was, was the, the, the black theater. Right. That's, that's the one we could go to. Mm -hmm. I have cousins who... I had cousins who lived a block away from me who could pass, mm. and they went to the uh, white Cuban theater. Uh -huh. and, but not all of them did. There were seven of them, and some of them were dark, and they couldn't go. <laughs> so some, some of, the, uh, some of my, my, my cousins, especially the girl cousins, were, were, were publicly... Uh, um, White Cubans, I see. but so, and their brothers—they they couldn't be white Cubans. <laughs> they were too dark. <laughs> That's I ironic. Uh -huh. So, so there was a white Cuban theater also. Oh yes, the, the white the white Cubans had a very, very uh, developed uh, economic um, economic base, and they had they had uh, more than they had one very very. Luxurious theater, and they had the, the center, which was the, the center was was very very important. There was a Spanish center, a big building, and an Asturian center, and a, an Italian center, and a, and a white Cuban center, and a black Cuban center. And the, what kind of movies were shown at the white Cuban theater? I, I re, I, you know, run of the mill. Oh. What was what was, what was just like now, oh, they weren't. They weren't like Spanish language. Oh, they, they weren't. They weren't. That many. Uh, they might have yeah. one. It would be a, it would be a, a novelty. But mostly, they, they uh, had the fare of, of just any old American theater. I see. Okay, and that was true of the black theater. 
also? <laughs> it was through the Black Theater too. We, uh -huh. we, we, we uh, uh, followed Tom Mix. <laughs> you heard Tom Mix? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And Tom Mix was our hero too. <laughs> Uh, John, Johnny Mac Brown for my generation, Roy <laughs> Rogers. So, uh, you know. yeah. For my generation, it was Tom Mix. We, uh -huh. we, uh, we, we thought he was the catch pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, what about, what about dating patterns once people got to junior high or mm -hmm. high school? Or? Very, very interesting. Most of the black Cuban girls sought African-American men and married them. And, and the black Cuban men sought African-American girls mm -hmm. and married them. So there was much more inter There was, there was some black Cuban, black Cuban marriages, but very few. Mm -hmm. They, they, uh, they, uh, I, I have a passage that I that I like in my book, in which I describe that. Which says, uh, uh, there were differences and, and and slight tensions, but but uh, all in all, we we were we were fully integrated in the social life of. Uh, of African Americans, except that we didn't go to the churches because we were Catholics, and it was not—it was a sin to go to a Protestant church. <laughs> <laughs> Silly idea. And so the church, the, the Catholic church that you went to, was the Black Catholic Church. It was a Black Catholic church, mm -hmm. and so Black Cubans would go to that, but also Blacks who were not Cuban. Yes, mm -hmm. mostly Blacks who were not Cubans. Mm -hmm. Mostly blacks who were not Cubans. We, we were, we were the minority, mm -hmm. among. We were a sub minority. In the uh, min minority, which was the African American, mm -hmm. they would they would uh, they would tease me. You know, they would they would uh, in school. You know, you know, children tease each other about anything in school. So they would. I would hear the, uh, they called me Tallywop. Uh, I have that in my book too. And Tally is, um, is a pejorative for Italians, mm -hmm. and so is Wop. Th those are two pejorative terms. My classmates didn't know the difference between Spanish and Italian, so they called us Tallywops. And so I would hear, and my name is, my name is, um, means cricket. Grillo means cricket. Grillo is cricket. So, so my little schoolmates would, uh, would holler at me across the, the playground, hey, grasshopper. <laughs> hey, grasshopper, you tallywop. So that, that was, that was a burden I, I, uh, I had throughout my childhood being called a grasshopper and a tallywop. <laughs> but it's all, in retrospect, it's all very, it's, it's interesting, you know. While I was going through it, I was, I was, um, I didn't know how to take it. I was incensed and, and, I, and I had no way of protesting because I got my, my head chopped off. Though I never, I never was, I never was, uh, never, not once was I into any, any physical um, confrontation. We were, we were absorbed, and and we were, we were, we, we became, we had, we had very, very uh, integrated experience in the African American community. And of course, the girls like me, and I like the girls. <laughs> and so I would, I, girls, I remember Pauline, and I, I would, and the 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 the, uh, the African American boys weren't. Too, they thought Pauline belonged to them, you know, and Pauline was a 
was a fantastically beautiful girl. And, uh, and I ended up going to the moves with Pauline and taking her home the long way around where trees and, and, and dark streets provided uh, uh, proper settings for, for kissing and hugging and, and, and doing the things that adolescents do. Or, or, or the people. <laughs> what about, so the, the Cubans that were considered white Cubans, who, who did they date? They dated each other and the whites. No. They, they, didn't have, they didn't have social relationships with black Cubans. The, we, had, we had a very, very strange relationship. We would go to funerals. And I don't ever remember going to a wedding, but I went to, to, uh, with my mother to the, the funeral of, of some white Cuban who had died. And, and uh, I remember my, my, my sister being sent to the home of a white Cuban uh, person who, who had a baby, and she, my sister was sent over to help. But that's that's at the extent of my my recollection of any uh, of any interaction, any social interaction. I never played with a white child, not one. Not, I don't know the name of a single white child. I don't have the face. I don't have. I, ha I have. I have memories, very fond memories, of an Italian boy who played with us, and and it it was. It was a group of black Cubans, black Americans, and Italian. And, and, and this Italian boy was, um, well, he liked us, and he played with us. And I, and I, I remember him very well. Now, how much of this, the, the attitude and the relationship between black Cubans and white Cubans how much of that was actually brought over from Cuba, do you think, and how much of it was a reflection of the mainland United States? Well, well some of it was born, brought over from Cuba because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a myth, you know, and then, then, then no, well, it's a myth. The white Cubans are white, and they are Spanish. They are descendants of Spaniards. And and the, the Spaniards, I, I, I figured that they had the best public relations man on earth because they must have advised them not to call themselves Spanish, but to call themselves whatever, whatever the, the geographic um, afforded them the opportunity. So they're Peruvians and Ecuadorians and, and Costa Ricans and, and Nicaraguenses and... and, and and see, and they all are governed by Spaniards. The Spanish are the are the biggest influence in the even in Florida. Now, there, there's a lot of integration of Spaniards and white Cubans, but make no mistake about it. The power and the money is in the hands of Spaniards. Okay, so okay, so I wanted to ask you then. You went to you you went to school in Ybor City, in Tampa. Uh, but then not Ybor City. Oh, in, the right. school was not in Ybor City. The school was in Tampa. right across. There was a line. Nebraska was the line uh -huh. between the, the mixed ghetto of black Cubans and African Americans and white Cubans mm -hmm. and the all black ghetto. And so we had to cross Nebraska Avenue and walk about three blocks to go to the school, which was in the, the, the uh, African American uh, the African American ghetto. Uh -huh. Okay, but then you wound up going to a different high school. Before you graduated, you, you high school yeah. in a different area. I went to high school. I went to school in Tampa, Florida, until the tenth grade, 
And then I went to Washington, D.C. I was taken to Washington, D.C. My brother was in Washington, D.C., and, and I joined my brother in Washington, D.C., and I, and I graduated from Dunbar High School, uh, which is what was a, one of the premier high schools for blacks in the country. And they, it competed favorably mm -hmm. with all the Ivy League schools, and 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 Dunbar students would go to the Ivy League schools uh, by the dozens. Uh, they uh, they uh, they would they would attempt to go even to the um, to the while they were in high school, to the prestige prep schools in the New England. But then they were returned to Dunbar because Dunbar, Dunbar was, uh, was, was their school and their opportunity to meet and socialize and eventually to find mates. So, so they would come back from those prep schools. Uh -huh. I see. And you graduated from Dunbar. I graduated from Dunbar High School. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Uh, I suppose uh, that's one of the one of the happy because I because I did well at Dunbar. I, I was cocksure and competitive, but I. But I, my mentor who took me to, to Washington, when he, when he gave me the ticket to go from Richmond to Washington, he said, now boy, he gave me the ticket. And the same $5 bill I had given him, he'd asked my mother to give me. And he said to me, boy, you go on up there and show him what a southern colored boy can do. And that's one of the, that's one of the piercing memories. And I went, and I showed him. <laughs> Didn't make me too popular, but I was as competitive as I came. I studied and studied and studied and studied. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and when the honor roll would come out, the teacher would always start out. <laughs> They put the honor roll on the board, you know, and I was like, oh, gee. <laughs> and in my, with my little smug self, I said, I said, I'll learn you. <laughs> I had a wonderful time in Dunbar High School. You mentioned in, in the book that uh, in school you were, you were exposed to a lot of history, that you learned a lot of history, including black history. Um, yeah, well, well, that's the history that I learned, and, and including in, in Tampa, you know, that was my history. And my heroes were Frederick Douglass and, uh, and Sojourner Truth, and, and uh, those were my heroes. And I, and I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't read anything about any black Cuban heroes or black Cuban spirit. I was, in, I was completely involved with the African American society. You know, we, we, I was, I was uh, boyfriends and girlfriends and buddies and loyalties and every once in a while a spark would fly based on the language difference. But but never anything, never anything mean or, or harsh or physical. It was, it had, I, had, I had buddies, I had real buddies, Carl Warren, I remember. And, you know, they were my, he was my buddy, you know. And, uh, and of course I had, I, I wasn't, I wasn't very sophisticated about how, to, how one gets a, a girlfriend, but I got some, and so 
I never went with a black Cuban girl. Well, so then after you finished high school, you went to college. Yes, sir. I went. I went to. <laughs> I had a. I had a mentor, a, a very, uh, a very great man named Dr. Howard Thurman, who was the dean of the chapel of Howard University, and he and his wife sort of took me in. Uh, I, I lived in their home a short periods of time, but I, I never lived too far away from them, and I spent every day I was in their house. And so I, when I finished high school, of course, I knew everything. I was, and so I, I went to see him and I asked him how one got into Howard or how, how would, or, and, and one teacher had, had talked to me about a possible scholarship to Michigan. And I said, um, and so I asked him, he said, and he told me, he was like a father to me, he said, you're not going to Howard? <laughs> Sternly, he said, you, you, it's too cold up here and you're too poor. You can't even afford the clothes. <laughs> you can't even, you have, to go, you have to go to school where it's warm. He said, he said and you, you're going to Xavier. He told me just like that. You're going to Xavier. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Xavier. He says, they, they will want you there and they will, they will, they will find a way to finance your education. So, he, so he said, you, you go around and find out about Xavier and get all the papers and, all, and come to see me. When you, so I, I did that. And I, I applied. And, and uh, three, three weeks before the beginning of the semester, I hadn't heard. So I went to him and I said, I haven't heard. And he said, you haven't heard? He said, do you know any Xavier graduates around here? I said, yeah. Go ask them to help you. So I went, I, you two, two were, were studying law, and they said, you're very lucky, the dean's in town. And he called the dean up, Dr. Thurman, and said, Dr. Sister Sophie, Sister Madam Sophie, I'm very glad to meet you, because I have a young man in my office who is going to Xavier University. And that's just the way he said it. He didn't say he wants to go. Or he's applied to go. He said he was growing, and he had the authority of position, and they had a long talk. And next thing I knew, I was on a train. I went off to Xavier University in New Orleans, Louisiana, which was an all-black school for Catholics. <coughs> and uh, and I uh, and I had a. Um, a, a very rich experience there. Uh, and, and graduated. I, 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 could, I could tell a thousand stories about Xavier University, but they're not, they're not necessarily distinguishable so that they're, 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 they're worth spending a lot of time on. Well, you were, you were quite active at Xavier, though, in student activities. Oh yes! Oh, 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 oh yes! I was, I was in every play, and I was, uh, oh, I was in every play, and I was, uh, the, I won the Ari Taco contest, and and uh, I was all over the place. I was, I was, but you know, I, I was competitive, and and cocky, and conceited, and. Uh, and there was part of my mission in life was to excel so that I could show them, so everybody else how, how good I was. You know, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't until I got older and saw how how uh, counterproductive that is. You know, mm -hmm. that that attitude. You don't you don't make many friends being competitive. <laughs> I found that out too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what years were you at Xavier? 1937 to 1940. I, 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 uh, I did it in, in seven semesters, going to summer school. Mm -hmm. There was a reason why I didn't enter the, the first semester. But 
that's another story, and then I go off on it. Uh, I um, I was I was taken to Mexico by my mentor, uh, and when I came back, I got a fever, and so I couldn't go to school my first semester. So I entered in January, and I f finished in. in I finished in the class of thirty, the class of forty. You know. Okay. Um, so you got out right before World War II, or right before the U.S. entered World War II. Oh yes, the year before. As soon as I, I, I finished in forty, and I was in the army. In uh, I was in the army uh, in June of forty-one. And did you? Were you drafted? Did you enlist? Yes, I was drafted. I was drafted. Uh, in fact, I was drafted. I was drafted uh, early, very early, but I got a, a, a one semester deferment because I went I, I enrolled in Howard, Howard University Graduate School, and they let me stay there until they finished the semester. And, they, and they, one day I finished the semester, and the next day I was on my way <laughs> to Fort Meade, Maryland, for basic training. Uh -huh. And then I went off to India. Now the graduate, uh, the uh, one semester of graduate work was in what field? I, I have a hard time remembering the field, but I think it was in French. That, that, that became very insignificant when I went into the mm. army and I spent four years. And mm. that, that semester was, it's like a blur. Mm. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was in French. Okay. So then you went to train to basic training, where? In Fort Meade, Maryland, right oh. outside of Washington D.C. Okay. And uh, and uh, we were ta we were taken off. We were, we went to basic training and and uh, we went off to um, from basic training. I well, was sent to MacDill, Florida, MacDill Field, Florida, to form a new outfit and. And within months, within months we were we were sent overseas. And what what outfit was that? That it was outfit? called the 823rd Engineer Battalion. Well, now engineer is a euphemism. It was a slave labor battalion. That's what it was. Um, and uh, um, we went to India, and I. Uh, I spent 32 months in India. I had 14 bouts of malaria. Well, you uh, went you went directly from Florida Mac to India. From Magdilfi, Florida to India. By ship. Uh huh. We went to we went we went to uh, ostensibly to maintain the air bases from which the planes would fly over the hump, the Himalayas to do battle in China, China, but eventually we were taken away from that duty and sent to build the Lido Road, and we built the road. We were one of the outfits that built the road that went from India into Burma and connected with, it, with, with the road from China into Burma. Uh, and uh, we spent a lot of time and used up a lot of a lot of young people dying of typhus and typhus, <clears throat> um, and when we had achieved our objective of breaking through to China, uh, the war was over. The, the, the war was over. By the time we, uh, the Japanese. Um, they, they they hadn't surrendered because I came back before the Japanese surrender and the German surrender, but uh, it was it was they were on the ropes both of them. How's how's the time on that? Getting low now. Not five minutes. Maybe we should go ahead and change at this point. We're going to change tapes. Okay. Here the tapes that we use are only. Okay. Experience. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, so you um, you mentioned you enlisted in 1940. 
I didn't enlist, I was drafted. You were drafted in 1940, and then you, were, you went on this long, fairly long sh ship journey to India. 58 days. 58 days. And you went around the... Around the Horn. Around the Horn. Is, is that right? So. Around, it's either the Horn or the Cape of Good Hope. One or the other. <laughs> I, I can never remember either. Yeah. I think it's the Horn, yeah. yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you also now, the unit that you were in, was it a segregated unit? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It was, it was, a, absolutely, I, uh, it was a, an all-black outfit led by all white officers. We were just like slaves and slave masters. And what was your rank? I, I, I reached the rank of staff sergeant. Um, eventually, towards the end of our stay there, one or two fellows were set, sent back for officers' candidate school. And they were, of course, uh, the um, accommodating, submissive types, and they made it. All of us, all of us troublemakers, why we weren't fit to be officers. Why, why were you considered a troublemaker? Well, because, because uh, I, would, I, I, I was, by that time, as well-educated as anybody in the outfit, so I knew how to how to how to address grievances in 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 a manner that did not not uh, invite uh, retribution. So I, I I was I was always on the offices about this that and the other, you know, but but lodging the protests in a very respectful manner and and. Uh, one time, one time, one officer got a little impatient with me. So we we have, we have uh, the guardhouse for for uh, for your kind of behavior, Sergeant Grillo. And I said, "Let's go. Let's go." And he changes subject. He changes. He changes tune very quickly because if they'd have taken me to the guardhouse, they would have had held me. <laughs> I, I was perceived by the men, you know. He he's going to talk for us. He's going <laughs> to so so. I, although I wasn't a buddy buddy, uh, I was highly respected by the men. And then, of course, I I. Uh, um, I, uh, it's a long story, but so I'll, I'll skip it, except to say that the time came when I was appointed the Recreation and Morale Sergeant. That came about because we finally got a black chaplain. and. Um, and uh, the chaplain was an officer, so he, so the commanding officer asked him to take over, doing something for recreation and morale, and he and he told him, "Yep, I'm willing to do that if I can have who I want to work with me." And they said, "Who do you have in mind?" He said, "Sergeant Griddle." And, and so. So I, I got the position, and, and, and he brought a jeep with it, the, the commanding officer, and, he, and he, he gave me the keys and said, here, do what you want to do, and just tell me where I signed. So I had a, I had a, a, a fantastic experience. Just a fantastic experience. Uh, we, we did all kinds of things. We built a baseball diamond. We built a theater. We <laughs> and uh, and it's, it was very important to do that because we had a we had a theater with with, with canvas 
roof, you know. But we had a place to see things while it rained. So all the shows would stop at our place. <laughs> and the cars would come down from all the hills, all the yellow outfits, you know, to see the show at our place. And then we had a newspaper. We had a newspaper that we published every day. Nothing but war news, no features. No. We just want to know how many more Germans did they shoot. <laughs> and the, and, the, and the, the fellows along the road, see this was a road, the, the ordnance outfit and the, in the, and the um, quartermaster, all those kinds of outfits were on the road, on either side of the road. So they would come, come down in, the, in their cars with, with reams of paper to give us so that we would give them copies of our newspaper. They ignored the, uh, the, the base newspaper, you know, the, the, the newspaper put out, you know, cute sea articles and, <laughs> and feature stories like that. And for hell with that, we want to know how many divisions did they destroy it. <laughs> we want we want to know the news is going to get us home. <laughs> so that's, we 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 uh, we did that newspaper, and it was called the, the Harry Ears Herald. Harry Ears is a, Harry Ears is, a, is the uh, the uh, moniker applied to engineers. Harry Ears engineers, and we call ours the, the Harry Ears Herald. And one once a day it would come out one 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 mimeograph sheet with. Nothing but what happened in Japan and what happened in Okinawa and what happened <laughs> in Europe, man. And, and uh, it, was a, it was a riot. It would <laughs> and this was read by white and black? Oh, yes. We were the black outfit. There was another black outfit on the road. The, all the rest of the, the, the outfits were white. What did they, oh, yeah, they, they came on down. The, 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 the cars, the jeeps and the command cars, I, I don't know, that doesn't mean anything to you, but the, auto, the vehicles would come on down that road and up that road all with, with their reams of paper to give us, so we would give them <laughs> copies of the Harry S. Herald. And the, Her the Harry S. Herald became, became the newspaper along the road. That's, the, that, that's what the fellas wanted. They, <laughs> they couldn't give a damn about a feature, a cutesy feature about what, what, what Sergeant did when he was in the United States. I mean, you aren't interested. <laughs> they wanted the cold, hard facts about what, how many, how many Germans were killed and how many Japanese were killed, and so on. Oh, and, uh, cause, and and we could we could we could feel the 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 momentum, you know. Uh, how long did you publish that paper? I, oh, Lord have mercy, I, I, I published it. I, I published it for about two years. And you were the editor? No, the no. I, 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 uh, you were the whole thing. I, I was, I, I, I made that possible. The, the, the newspaper staff had to, well, it wasn't uh, hierarchical, you know. I, I wasn't their boss or their supervisor. But I, 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 uh, I recruited them and, and encouraged them to, and so, so I had daily intercourse with them, but I wasn't the editor. I, w I, was, uh, I was, and in fact, uh, no, I, I was busy getting, getting um, the theater built and getting the, uh, the, uh, the recreation rooms built. You know, recreation rooms were built out of split bamboo. And, and they, we had four companies, and so our, the four companies were were stationed at different ports along the road. So I, I built a recreation room for every one of the companies, and uh, and I would travel up and down the the road in in the search for ping pong balls. <laughs> and I had to get those damn ping pong balls. <laughs> Because <laughs> everybody had a ping pong table or, or two, and and I I would travel 50 miles to to, uh, to find ping pong balls in in Indian stores, you know. 
And now, where did the information come from that you put in the Harry Ears Herald? The headquarters staff, the headquarters mean the, the people, we were the headquarters, but company, and they are concerned with logistics and, and records. And the headquarters staff, a very, very intelligent group of men, and they would, they would, I had a tent and, and, a, and a very, very, very adequate radio, and they would come and take notes off the broadcast. They would take notes of four broadcasts from the Delhi, the Armed Forces Radio, and the Radio Free, something or the other. And they would all have the same news, you know, but it gave us a chance to get the news. And so four would take it down in longhand, and then they would compare notes and come out with the story, which was the story that was on the radio. And uh, that's all we wrote. That's all. That's all we had. What happened in what happened in Okinawa and what happened in I, f I forget the the great battles of the of the Pacific with the, with Iwo Jima. Uh, Guadalcanal. Yeah. Here we, yeah, we had that. <laughs> we had that, and 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 in, and of course in Europe, you know, the Russians and the, we were we were, uh, and and there was there was there was the hope of being able to to tr transport large numbers of 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 troops over the road, you know, the logistics of flying and the, and the equipment, so. So finally, the one combatant outfit emerged called Merrill's Marauders. You may have heard of them. And they, they came up through the road. I made some very good friends in the Merrill's Marauders. They were. So they, Merrill's Marauders then went over the road that your outfit helped build in. Yeah, uh, into Burma into and Burma. and into China to to to, uh, to fight. Mm -hmm. And they got they got mown down by typhus. Those, those poor young men. They got lots of typhus deaths. Much more much more than gun deaths. Typhus was typhus. I don't know anything about medicine, but typhus must have been a scourge because you would get typhus and you would die. Uh, uh, then around the typhus, all of us malaria jocks were because uh, you get a relapse from malaria. I had 14 relapses. Um, so the malaria, <coughs> the malaria prone, or the malaria, the malaria infected, uh, would would circulate in the hospitals along with the typhus. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of more questions about the paper. Uh, how was it published? Was it mimeograph? Oh yes, mimeograph. Oh yes, mimeograph. How long would any given issue be? Uh, one page. One page. One, pa one page was all. It came out every day. Every single day. Every single day. I think it came out. I, it may not have come out on on Sundays, but but um, every day, it, it, and we'd have it. We'd have it done so you could call for it by two o'clock. And uh, and in would come the cars, the fellows waving their reams of paper. <laughs> how, how did the military command feel about your paper being published? Well, you know, um, we did, we didn't editorialize anything. We, 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 we didn't talk about 
we talked about the war. So, so it wasn't really, it wasn't really an offensive paper because it just reported the news that they were hearing on the radio all day long. Uh, um, but I think your question is significant because uh, they, they did not know how important the function of, of recreation, facilitating recreation and facilitating um, um, events that had significance to the men was, and it, it, uh, I'll go off on a, into a, an explanation of, of, um, the growth that's promoted by well-run recreation programs. And so uh, they became aware. They became aware and then they began to facilitate. And when you had a change of command, the new, the new commanding officer, who was from Wisconsin, the other one was from Louisiana. And, and, and it's so much a, an example of what culture does to people. Because the, the, the Southern was constrained and rigid, and the Melvin guy was open and interested. And so he, he was very, very, um, he watched me at work, and he said, uh, you need a tent. He built me a great big tent, a double tent for my office, <laughs> so I could have all my, my trappings, you know, the, 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 the balls and the bats and the, and the games and the, and the, uh, and a place to meet we had to, we had meetings to plan things, you know. It was, it was wonderful. It was, it was very satisfying, very satisfying. And I, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. That eventually, when I got a chance to become a, a certified social group worker, I took it. I took it, and I, I never made a better choice. Uh, on the uh, on the paper, were there any particular stories that you remember that appeared in it that were particularly significant that had mm -mm. impact? They were what? All we were interested in how many tanks got destroyed. <laughs> no, no, no. Strictly the war news. Strictly the war news. And that's what the fellows wanted. That's what the whole damn. Uh, uh, Rogue wanted to know, you know, how are we doing in the war today? <laughs> how, how close are we to going back home again? So no, they they, they would have been they would have been uh, they would have laughed at, at any attempt to do feature stories. No, 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 no. They wanted the raw guts. <laughs> how many? 120 tanks. Great. <laughs> That's all. That's all, day in and day out. How many, uh, uh, so the whole, the whole bulge, you know, the, the whole, you know, we followed that like, like we were there, you know. The, uh, the staff that worked on the paper, were any of them people that had had experience in journalism mm. before? No, they were just intelligent men. They were college educated men, most of them. Mm -hmm. All of them. We had on that slave of battalion the flower of black youth were in that battalion. Brilliant men, capable men, and they were they were the, they were the typists and the clerks and the, so 
they, um, they, uh, they were very literate. And so they'd write out the stories and they'd check them with each other and then they'd decide if the story was right, it was accurate, because they got four different, four different radio programs and four different people taking them. So they were able to, to get the facts right. So he had the facts right. And that's all we want to know, how many tanks and how many trucks and <laughs> how, many, how many Germans were dead. <laughs> oh, it was, it was quite an experience. And did, did working with that paper have any repercussions for you later on in life? Did you ever do anything like that again? Uh, Did I ever do anything like that again? When we talked no. before, you'd mentioned when you were working in a juvenile hall. Uh, oh yes, yes. I uh, I didn't I, I didn't have I had the juvie jive. The juvie we called it the the administration didn't like that, so we called it the juvie news. Finally, I showed you copies of it, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that had, that, that, the previous experience in the Army had something to do. But I didn't, I didn't ever recognize it as something that I wanted to do with my life. Uh, um, I think, uh, And the, the Juvie Jive was a, a paper that was published by the uh, young people themselves. That that's right, absolutely, oh. absolutely. I, I showed you, yeah. and 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 it mattered. It mattered not what they wrote, and it mattered not how correctly they wrote it. We would make the, we would make, we would edit it so that gross, gross. Uh, Mistakes wouldn't be uh, published, but generally we kept it being what the youngsters wrote themselves. It seems so simple. It's so simple. So simple that you write something, that you wrote it, and it appears in print. And your name is there, by Joe Jones. It's so simple, but it, it's it's hard. It's it's hard to learn how to let people be free to do what they can do, the very best that they can do, the very best. And from that perspective, growth from level W to level R is much greater than the growth from level B to level A. You see what I'm getting at? And when, when you can perceive that and feel it, and see it happening, you know. It, it it gives you great motivation for letting people be free. Letting people be free and encourage them. You you learn. You learn. Um, you learn that that the greatest healing is done in our interactions with each other. You know, we don't know it's going on, but it, you're a changed man every day. As you learn more about yourself and learn more about the world. As you interact with people and find out about yourself and the world. I wanted to ask you also a little bit more about 
uh, your other experiences when you were there. You, you mentioned in the book that, uh, that uh, you were bombed a couple of times by Japanese mm -hmm. airplane. Can you oh. it, it, tw Twice we were bombed. But uh, it wasn't as the, the bombs were falling close to me. I was in the slit trench. You know, we had dug just for that purpose, and the planes were up way in the air, and and and, and the planes would fight in the air, and one of them would would get hit and go go, go down in flames. But that was that was like a, a movie. <coughs> it didn't ever affect me, so that I had a bomb, I had bomb fragments to worry about. These were Japanese planes coming from Burma, is that right? I don't know where they were coming from, but not from Burma. I, I never thought about where they were coming from. Aircraft carriers, hmm? from possibly aircraft yes, carriers. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that only happened twice. But uh, the uh, the big the big uh, the big casualty producers were the illnesses, malaria and typhus. I remember typhus, but I'm sure there were others too. But. They were, the casualties were cons considerable. So during the, uh, during the time that you were in the Army, you were, you were quite aware of the different ways in which black troops were treated from white troops. Were there, were there any other, by the way, Cuban mm -mm. troops? They, 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 they were scattered throughout, throughout the, uh, the army, and those who were maybe three or four shades lighter than I am, uh, would go in, in, into the white contingent, and the and then those who were clearly uh, African in derivation would be put into black outfits, and so there would be two in this one and five in that one, so they, they were scattered all around. And not all of them, not all of them had the great experience that I had of being educated among them. You know, the, 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 uh, I was indoctrinated just by being part of the system to be a black American. So I have a hybrid identity. They can't be told apart, and just like that. It's not this, that, and then that. And I'm, 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 I can be a Afro-Cuban. Uh, uh, be a, I can't. I, I have to be both at the same time, all the time. So the, the the white officers that you had, did you find that that they treated the, the black troops well or badly or? Well, they, 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 some of us treated us better than the others. All of, all of them were involved in the leading of black troops, and that made for an impossible equation right there. Right there. So uh, the, the ones who No, I won't go there. No, that's touchy ground, and I don't need to bring it up. Okay, well then I'd like to ask you some about what happened um, after you were in the service. You you actually came back to the U.S. before the end of the war. You had mentioned. Is that right? Oh yes, I came. I came. Uh, I came in January of 45 back to the States 
and the war was finally open, finally over in September of '45, and and <clears throat> I came over in January of '45, and the Japanese surrendered that spring. I don't know who surrendered first. The, the Germans, Germans sur first, yeah. they, the, the Germans surrendered, and then the Japanese. Uh, and one happened in September '45, or or something like that. But <clears throat> both surrenders happened after I came back from the from India. What was it like coming back to the U.S. at that point? Well, um, well, of course, I was still in the army, so I was still I was still. Um, in, uh, attached to uh, to outfits that had their own mission and their own, and they they uh, I think they saw us as kind of kind of little off, and I guess we were we 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 had this tremendous experience in India, which which. By by the very nature of the experience, uh, um, separated us from from the troops who hadn't had the experience, and uh, we didn't have a uh, we, we didn't have a uh, a role or a function in in the outfits that we were attached to. We were like like an, an odd. So it wasn't very comfortable, but but they didn't they didn't bother us. They 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 sort of um, this this sort of uh, of um, had forbearance with respect to us because we were by definition nuts. <laughs> You know, when something comes out like that, it's funny to you too. So, but I, I had never thought of the fact that, that that when I came back, the the army people I was involved with could have could have seen me as nuts. But I can I can in 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 recalling I can tell that they they were they were not too sure that I wasn't gonna gonna go off. <laughs> so they gave us a lots of room. What did you do after the war was over? After you were out of the, I, uh, I, I, I prepared very quickly uh, for entry into Columbia University, and I spent three years in Latin American history at Columbia University, and I got married and had babies and all that. Uh, woman that you married, so you, you met where? I met her at her college, at Beach College in Lewiston, Maine. And uh, I, went, I went to visit her roommate and came back with her. When was that? Huh? When was that? That was in... Forty-six. Could have been in forty-five, because I may, may have still been in the army. But I went up to Lewis and Maine. I was so tired of of going by to see people you know, who wanted to see me because I would come back. I was, I was so tired of that routine that so 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 I grabbed the chance to go up to. Lewis and Maine and visit this one girl that I knew. And, uh, and I came back with a wife. Uh, and, uh, and surprise of surprise, uh, seven months after we, we got married, she had a baby. <laughs> and then I had another child 16 months later. This was while you were still in school. Yeah. Yeah, I, I went. To, I went to Columbia University, and I lived in the student 
barracks student that has to, that took over an army camp and made apartments out of the barracks. You were on the GI Bill of Rights? Oh yes, GI Bill of Rights and living in the, uh, in the, in the housing provided by the university at a very low, very low uh, cost. Um, and I uh, <clears throat> spent um, between two and a half and three years at Columbia. And by that time, my mentor, my main mentor, Dr. Howard Thurman, had moved to California and was founding a church right here, Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. In Oakland? No, in San Francisco. And, uh, and of course, I, I was always a part of the family, you know. I, it was, I, uh, so, um, I, uh, I naturally followed him out to the West Coast. Why did you study, why did you pick Latin American history as a field? Why? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I saw myself as a possible bridge between uh, um, English-speaking and Spanish-speaking peoples, but especially between English-speaking blacks and, and uh, what are now what are now referred to as Latinos, which are the Spanish-speaking African Americans, which is what I am. I have uh, 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 somewhere in my ancestry there's some Spanish blood, but uh, but the most relevant piece of genealogy is that I'm an African American. I'm an, I'm an African. I'm an African in derivation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I, I pursued Latin American history. I didn't have a very happy time at Columbia. Uh, he, the major professor was Frank Tannenbaum, and he was... I, I read something about him. Well, he was, he was a racist of the first order. And uh, and I came west. <coughs> I came west to uh, to um, in following my mentor, and I found a position as the director of a community center of blacks, African Americans, and Mexicans. And I think now there is where I have chance to promote inter interaction. Where was that? In Oakland. In Oakland. Two of the happiest years of my life. I was, I was, um, I was director of the Alexander Community Center at Third and Linden, which was one of the poorest neighborhoods in Oakland. And I, and I spent two years, and I, I was, uh, I was encouraged to apply to the University of California School of Social Welfare. And I got a fellowship. And so I went on to school and I got my degree. My, at Berkeley. At Berkeley, UC Berkeley. But I, it, it's the most wonderful thing that could have happened to me. I, uh, I didn't know. I had no idea how powerful, how effective one can be in helping others grow, and and how I need to be helped to grow. And while I'm helping to grow, others they're helping me to grow. And it's 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 like a miracle. Uh, if you 
if you learn to to to, to talk minimally and to uh, encourage others. Um, to the maximum, maximum extent of your ability. And that's so simple. But it takes a great deal. It, it takes a great deal of hammering in the professional school to get you into a position where you become humble enough to realize your limitations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I uh, I wanted to follow up a little more with the uh, the post-war experience. So you came out here to California, and then you went to um, you were director of the community center, and then you went to Berkeley and got a master's in social welfare, right? Uh, and then after that, uh, what what did you do? I, um, when, when I was the director of the community center, I was an employee of the Oakland Recreation Department. And it was a great department in that era. Um, and I had two years of in-service education within the recreation department using a social group work frame of reference. And that's what led me to get the fellowship. Uh, so going to the University of California and receiving my degree in social group work, I was, I was, uh, when I came back, I got a position as community relations consultant of the Oakland Recreation Department. And the main, the main thrust of that position was the promoting of collaboration and integration and cooperation among the many agencies that have to do with the same client population. So you are put, pulling them in one direction in education, now I'm pulling them in one direction in uh, uh, recreation and somebody's pulling them in another direction from the health point of view and another person pulling them in another direction because he's on probation and all of this is all is 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 often as often as not in a in a in a veritable chaotic where, where there isn't even communication about two professionals, both of which may be seeing the child or the family in the same day. So uh, that, that, that was my great, great mission. And, uh, uh, um, and, I, and from commun community relations consultant of the Oakland Recreation Department, I was finally asked to come and work in the city manager's office. I was the first black to ever work in the city manager's office. And my function was to promote the development of the associated agencies of Oakland, which was the formalized, the formalized structure for collaboration, and, and which is what I developed. I developed it. As as um, as a peer, uh, uh, by in, encouraging us to meet and to discuss and to exchange and to set up systems whereby we would co we would communicate with each other about what we were doing and what was happening, and that that the clamor for the formalizing of that uh, became. Uh, pretty intense. 
and uh, the uh, city manager, uh, I thought, very wise uh, development, um, of asking me to come and, and do that as my function, promoting the collaboration of interagency cooperation among all of the agencies that are responsible for the same client population. And it, it, the, the, the rewards are, are, are incredible. You know, the, we, we don't have a sense of how important the groups to which we belong are. We have, we are, the, 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 there's no criticism implied in all of this, but we do think as though we are what we think. And so we can decide to do this with our, with our intellect. We, we analyze this and make a decision. We, it's not like that at all. It's all cultural, how, how we behave. Uh, and so the, the uh, The, um, the rewards of the promotion of collaboration is, are great. And now it's almost impossible for one to get a grant to do any kind of service unless one explicates how one is going to arrange for collaboration with peer agencies. Mm. So uh, that's, that's probably one of the most satisfying things I've done. Mm -hmm. Then as part of that, not as part of it, but concomitant became my, my uh, was my uh, involvement in the politics of Oakland, of the Bay Area, and the s state of California. And I, uh, I had a very, very, very uh, uh, satisfying experience because for 17 years, this was all volunteer, uh, I worked under a, with uh, the Byron Rumford um, organization, mm -hmm. which had in its uh, as its chief mover a man named D. G. Gibson, who was a political genius, and and who held enormous power in Alameda County and the Bay Area and the state of California. Uh, um, what usually happens is when a person like that goes out of the scene, he's remembered, but but his work, his, his work goes on. His work doesn't go on with the same kind of guidance, and, but but the results of his work, the the, the new culture that that he develops. So Oakland is a is a mecca for, for uh, ambitious blacks mm. who, who come here seeking a place to be and a place to, to express. And by osmosis or by, they, they hear that Oakland's a pretty new, good place to be a black. And so they come. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that's the legacy I had a, a hand in developing. Uh -huh. What years were those that you worked with? Um, <clears throat> 1953. And uh, that's when you started. Uh, really? That's when I, when I, when I. That's when I was able to say I'm going to do this. Or at least to feel it, 
and I did it. So I, and because I knew, I knew how to function with groups, I, uh, and working with D.G. Gibson and Byron Romford, I formed a, a group that whose influence has been tremendous. It, it included Lionel Wilson, who became mayor yes, of Oakland before he became judge or mayor. Uh, Tutored Alan Broussard, who was a second Supreme Court justice. Black, it, in, it included, uh, well, his name escapes me, but the first Supreme Court justice. Uh, it's, it's, it's a function of my loss of short term memory, but I, I'll, I'll get his name out of the, uh, the, the first Supreme Court justice. That Pat Brown appointed. Um, uh, was in that group. Novel Smith, the Chancellor, you know, the president of, of uh, Merritt College, became uh, was a member of that group. Len Jones, who was a fantastic, uh, he was a vice president of a bank or something like that. And, and, and uh, and undertook it as his mission to, to help the organization fiscally, fiscally, orderly. Mm -hmm. And uh, Viola Taylor, uh, th these were great, great people. And we had about 15 like that. And that was my group. And uh, did the group have a name? Or? You know, yes, we were the East Bay Democratic Club, okay. and the club was was very large. Mm -hmm. But these were the these were the, the prime movers in the club. Mm -hmm. The club was a, a fantastic organization. There's big big meetings and and very very. Uh, substantial programs. Uh, you know, you you know, you know, you're pretty good when everybody starts claiming you as part of their what uh, what they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I uh, I had a hand in just about every campaign. Mm -hmm. I was the uh, I had a hand in the election of uh, um, Senator Alan Cranston to the Senate. Um, I, uh, I am. Uh, I had a hand in in the development of the Spanish-speaking Unity Council, which became the Unity Council, whose director is Arabella Martinez, whom whom I developed. I helped develop. I. I. Uh, I I, she taught me, and I taught her. Uh, uh, um, and, and it's fantastic. You hear about the fruit bale, and you hear about the you read about the fruit bale. Well, the fruit bale is vibrant. It's vibrant. It's an identifiable economic entity, which which is which is vibrant. Yeah, you know? I noticed a lot of new businesses there. Yeah, well, yeah. that came about as a result of Arabella's great work in developing that community and encouraging people to come into that community and giving them something to work at when they came. And so that, in the Fruitville, there has always been a, a board dedicated to the promotion of developing the Fruitville. It's been the Unity Council Board. Mm -hmm. And what Arabella Martinez has done is, is incredible. She has a $100 million project called the Transit Village. And, and, and it's being built. And the idea of the Transit Village, which means how, how to develop around, around 
major locuses of rapid transit. So the Fruitvale was a rapid transit station. And now there's an attempt to, to develop one around the West Oakland. <clears throat> well, Arabella, first of all, she, you have to learn a lot of things to do good community organization. And she's, she's developed the, the respect and the trust and the belief and, the, and delivered the programs that, that, that foundations have, have um, supported and which they believe in and they keep supporting. So she gets federal money and state money and, and, and the, well, well the, the, the best evidence, of course, is the emergence of the fruit rail as a locus of, of major significance. And that's where they went to have their, their, their rumbles uh, uh, after the, the championship game. You know, that, that, that's, they didn't go to, they didn't go to, to uh, any place that had, it doesn't have a, a strong organized base. And, and Fruitvale has a strong organized base. How, how have you found over the years that Mexican Americans and other Latinos, you know, relate to you as a black Cuban? Oh, you know, with great ambivalence. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, so what else is new? Do they, <laughs> First do you, do you, place, this gives me a chance mm -hmm. to give voice to my approach to the term Latino. Mm. And Latino is a reality. And the Latino identity has caught on like wildfire. And everybody is Latino, and Latino, and Latino this, and Latino that. And we Latinos, well, Latino, Latinos does violence to the fundamental identity of the person because it doesn't tell you a thing mm -hmm. except that they have some Spanish in the background. And it is very convenient because by using the term Latino they can be done with any any Suspicion. <laughs> That's not the good word, suspicion. Any, any implication that they are somehow Africans. Mm. Well, the fact of the matter is that most Latinos have African in their background at some. Mm. And Latino gives them a rubric that can take out of the discussion any African American antecedent. And so now they have a new they come from. They come from a country called Latino. <laughs> Latino land, you know. <laughs> and so, so uh, I, I permit myself to be called a Latino, but other people call me a Latino. I don't call myself a Latino. I call myself a Black Cuban, mm -hmm. because that refers to my, to my, uh, my Cuban roots and to my Black roots. And that's what I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Well, unless you want to add something else, that's, I think it's a great interview. Uh, no, I don't, I don't want to add anything else. I, oh, okay. I, uh, I could talk on forever. <laughs> uh, well, and you give me a chance uh, to talk, to do what I'd like to do the rest, which is to talk. Yeah, well.